Happy Kokomo Friday and welcome into Fantasy Baseball Today presented by Line and Kugels. More on their delicious beverages later on in the podcast. Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White, who single-handedly got rid of the couches that you normally see behind him here on YouTube. Scott, how'd you do it, man? A lot of brute force. Now, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't remember, Frank, because you weren't here yet, but two years ago, uh, you know, we were doing a podcast like we are now. It wasn't being broadcast live on YouTube, but you know, it was being clipped to put on YouTube later. And in the middle of me talking, these guys start disassembling my living room behind me because they arrived to install windows and they came earlier than expected. So I was still in the middle of the podcast and my, my living room starts coming undone behind me. So I, I guess I invited those guys back and, and this time they, they made off with my furniture. But no, no, um, we're getting we're getting new new sofas, a sofa and a love seat for the living room, and uh, we've made room for them. We've made room for them. I, I've seen the comments, you know, it being broadcast live on YouTube. There's comments and people comment live. I've I've seen your comments, your 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 snide remarks. It's quite a bit of snoot there in the comments calling. Calling our living room, my the living space my family has built together, saying I'm broadcasting from my grandparents' basement or something, because they don't look like the look of my sofa. That I'll admit, you know, it, it looks probably like it's 40 years old, and so it's it's not. Eh, it might be 20 years old, but it's old, and now it's gone. And so you know, when you get a new house. You know, you, you pretty much empty your bank account and you have all this new space to fill. And it's like, you're going to buy furniture right away. You you're, you're think you're going to die because your bank account's near emptied, right? So, you know, we, we took we took my wife's grandmother's sofa and we put it back there. Little did I know it would be the backdrop for every podcast and I'd have to hear about it every show. But, you know, the government keeps throwing money at us. So we decided to get new sofas. So hopefully... Hopefully this appeals to the taste of the commenters out there and they can stop giving me a hard time for the way my living room works. I love it. I love it. Scotty looks, is fired words, up. Looks. <laughs> Scotty is fired up. I mentioned two weeks ago, Scott was on here ranting and raving about Will Craig not stepping on first base, who has been uh, optioned back to the minor leagues, by the way. I don't know if that factored in the decision, but... I love it, man. Scotty's rants every Friday. We're going to do it right here. Scott, have you ever seen the movie Grandma's Boy? No. It's, it's like your favorite movie, though, right? It is one of my favorite movies. And, you know, people are starting to... Is Polly Shore in it? No. <laughs> He's, he might as well should have been, based on the <laughs> cast of that movie. Nick Swartzen plays a huge role, and I, I love him as well. Uh, but, yeah, I've seen a bunch of, like, cheesy comedies in my life. There's a scene in that movie where people come in. The guy wasn't paying his rent. He didn't know. It, long story short, people just start packing up his stuff behind him. And he's like, who are you guys? And, and that's what I was just reminded of. I thought it was a pretty similar situation. That is your homework. Not for this weekend, because I'm just throwing it at you now. I don't know. By the end of June, let, let's get Scott White to watch Grandma's Boy. Today on the podcast, week 12 sleepers, two-star pitchers, random big whiff games from random starting pitchers, two bigger names you might be able to drop. I think we're going to talk about one here at the top. What's wrong with Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman? Your APR questions and much more. Let's jump right in, Scott. Oh, my good, goodness gracious. All right. You are, oh, my goodness gracious standout from Thursday. So I feel like my, oh, my goodness gracious picks have leaned more toward the negative lately. And that's what I'm doing again here with Eduardo Rodriguez. Another really bad start for Eduardo Rodriguez. He gave up six earned runs in four and two thirds innings. That's now four earned runs or more in five of his past six starts. It's taken his ERA from 382 to 603, which is bad. And hopefully, hopefully, you gave up on starting him a while ago because that's you know he's he's hanging. He's been hanging a crooked number on you for a while now, and I don't. I don't. I don't really get what's going on with them. I don't. Um, I'm not saying you know. Obviously, he needs to be out of your lineup. Does he need to be dropped? I, I think it's certainly in the discussion in like a 12 team league or shallower. But you look at 
all the expected stats across the board. They make him out not to just be better than he's been. They make him out to be really good. His XFIP, this is af- updated after this start, is 344. His XERA, uh, this is actually from, uh, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. There it is. Okay. His XERA is 357. Even his FIP is 370, despite you know a higher than usual home run rate. Even even the FIP, which takes into account home run rate, estimates ERA including home run rate versus the XFIP, which does fly ball rate. Um, you know that the FIP is 370, which is certainly respectable. So I, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. It doesn't. It doesn't totally add up to me. I don't see how you can trust Eduardo Rodriguez until he puts together a couple decent starts in a row. Probably is what it would take at this point. But the walk rate is like the lowest he's ever had. The strikeout rate is about the highest he's ever had. So I don't know. It's 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 the, it's the strange case of Eduardo Rodriguez. It is very strange for all the reasons that you highlighted. The underlying numbers are very good for him on the season. His last eight starts, he has a 7.58 ERA. That is a long stretch of starts to be that bad. So he is one of the players I wanted to ask, Scott. Can we drop him? And I'm going to throw a bunch of names your way. Some of the most added starting pitchers on CBS. And you tell me, yes or no, can you drop Eduardo Rodriguez for these pitchers? First one up is Tarek Skubal. Yes. Austin Gomber. You can. You can. I, I don't think that's a must. Tucker Davidson. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't I think, of the, I think in the long run, I think from today forward, my honest opinion is Rodriguez is going to be better than Tuck, um, Tucker Davidson. But, but, I mean, if Davidson has one more start like the three he's had, I think we'll see a mass pickup event of him. Mm -hmm. And I think like the thing is, if you drop Eduardo Rodriguez now, again, thinking like 12 teams are shallower, who's picking him up? Who's picking him up? Probably nobody. Not immediately. And his next start comes at the Braves. So don't like that either. Yeah. So you could, you could drop Eduardo Eduardo Rodriguez for Davidson if you wanted to be aggressive and, and, uh, you know, kind of beat the rush to Davidson if if he does keep this going for another turn or two. How about for Logan Gilbert? Um, I don't feel much urgency to do that. I know Logan Gilbert's last start, there were some encouraging signs. He had a lot of swingy strikes, but it's it's not quite enough, especially since the results from that start weren't very good. Luis Severino, who is now 72% rostered and has started his rehab assignment for the Yankees. Ooh, yeah. Luis Ro- Luis Severino probably needs to be picked up everywhere. So if Eduardo Rodriguez is your path to making that happen, then totally fine with that. The last one I'm going to ask you about is one of those random starting pitchers who had a ton of whiffs on Thursday, Mike Miner. He was at the <laughs> Oakland A's. Seven innings, one run, one walk, eight strikeouts, a great performance, 19 swinging strikes on 106 pitches over his last six starts for Mike Miner. 3.32 ERA. 44 strikeouts over 38 innings pitched. He is 58% rostered and he faces the Tigers next week. All of a sudden, I am pretty interested in Mike Miner. Scott, would you make that swap? Eduardo Rodriguez for Miner. I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Yeah. If I, again, if I was going to put money on who had the better numbers from to rest of season from today, I, I would probably say what Rodriguez, but. You know that they're pre- they're pretty close in ranking to me for me, uh, Miner and Rodriguez. Certainly, Miner is more startable for this upcoming week, so I'd be fine with that. Miner is among my ten sleeper pitchers for the upcoming week, and as you mentioned, he's on a really nice run right now. Oh my goodness gracious! For me, I'm just going to highlight an entire team, and that team is the Miami Marlins, who won 11-4 against the Rockies. They had 16 hits, and we'll start actually on the pitching side of things. Trevor Rogers. Seven innings, two runs, one walk, eight strikeouts, 18 swinging strikes on 87 pitches. Eight of those came on the changeup, seven on the four-seam fastball. That's three straight quality starts for Trevor Rogers. He has allowed three earned runs or less in every start this season, a 2.02 ERA, 
and a 1.06 whip to this point. I think we do have to worry about him being limited at some point, potentially being shut down. I don't think that we're anywhere close to that point, but maybe in August is something we have to start to worry about. So continue to ride out with Trevor Rogers. But as we approach that time, I think we will talk more and more about potentially selling off on Trevor Rogers. Let's look at the offensive side of things here. 16 hits, 11 runs scored for the Marlins in this game. Jazz Chisholm, the jazz man. Went two for four with his eighth home run of the season. Jorge Alfaro went three, four, five with a run scored and an RBI. He is 24% rostered. Scott, all of a sudden we have a bunch of catchers on the waiver wire that are actually playing pretty well. So how would you rank these four? Alfaro, Eric Haas, Max Stassi, and William Contreras. Let's say if you play in a one catcher league. Look, one catcher league, I, I would probably go... I, I would sell out almost entirely for the short term with this group. Mm -hmm. Eric Haas, I don't have a lot of faith in him because he's a 28-year-old, basically career minor leaguer who hit 244 over his minor league career. He has a big strikeout right now, but he did show a lot of power and uh, he is getting playing time even in the outfield in addition to catcher. So I think, you know, if, 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 if it is a two catcher league and you have the freedom to kind of just ride the hot hand, I, I think he's my favorite for right now. Uh, if you're asking me to commit to one for the rest of the season, I actually think William Contreras is who I'd go with. Any concern over when Travis Darno returns? Do you still think Contreras is going to be the everyday catcher? No, but it, we're a long ways off from that. Yeah, I believe Darno is on the 60-day IL. Don't know when he's eligible to return, but it's not anytime let me, soon. Let me look at Stassi here real quick, because I know he's been hot since coming off the IL. He was gone for so long, and he's one of those players who seemed like he broke out in 2020 as much as that as much weight as that seemed to have. I'm being sarcastic there. Um, yeah. Stassi's I, I don't great, know. man. I picked him up in yeah. a two-catcher league, a 15-team two-catcher league. Stassi was available. I picked him up, I think, last week, and I've been just reaping all these rewards. So he had big power last year. He's shown some upside, but he has to stay healthy. He's dealt with so many injuries in his career. Uh, I do like Stassi quite a bit. If you do playing two catcher leagues, he might be available in yours. The last name I wanted to mention here, Starling Marte. Went four for five with his fifth home run of the season. Mind you, he missed about a month and a half with, I forget what the injury, I think it was an oblique injury. And since returning from the IL, he is batting 419 in 12 games. And on the season, he has a career high 11.7% walk rate. Whenever we would talk about Players who excel in Roto versus head-to-head -head points and the biggest differences there, Starling Marte has always stood out because he never walked this much. I don't know that he's going to keep this up for the rest of the season, but Scott, as long as he is walking a near 12% walk rate, he's going to be great in points leagues. He's averaging 3.9 fantasy points per game, which is fourth best among outfielders this season. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, frankly, he's hitting so well and still running plenty and still hitting for power. I mean, I mean, he's he's kind of never done all of those things in the same season, right? Had, had the had the 20 to 25 homer power and the 30 steal, uh, the 30 stolen bases and the high batting average. He's never done it all at once in the same season. He's kind of done two of the three at a time. But right now he's doing all of it. And then the walk rate on top of it. So it's... Um, yeah, I mean, he, he looks like, he looks like the stud outfielder. He's pretty much always been. It's just kind of a different mix right now. And he is older at this point. He's 32 years old. If I'm reading his spot track page correctly, he is in a contract year. So maybe some added motivation there for Stalling Marte to get the final contract of his career. He has been great. Hopefully, he can keep this walk rate up. The sticky stuff. We've got to talk about the sticky stuff because why not? And, of course, it involves my New York Yankees, those cheaters, those scoundrels. Aroldis Chapman was crushed on Thursday in the ninth inning. He allowed a game-tying two-run home run to Josh Donaldson. And when I say crushed, let me look up how far this home run was. This 
it was a mammoth home run by Josh Donaldson. Then not only that, that tied the game, and then two batters later, Nelson Cruz hits a walk-off two-run home run. What I noticed was that the fastball velocity was down 2.3 miles per hour. The fastball spin rate was down 129 RPM. The slider spin rate was down 184 RPM. So how's that for controversy, Scott? That is controversial. That is controversial. Yeah, no, I mean, I had the same thoughts you did. Um, the, the spin rate being down so much on both those pitches. It was interesting that the velocity was also down over two miles per hour on the fastball. Uh, but... Yeah, hard to make much of it with after just one outing. Obviously, Aroltis Chapman has a long track record of dominance before any of this uh, spider grip. Is that what it's called? Spider grip? Spider Spo- tack? Is that what it's called? Spider tack? I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, spider tack. Spider tack. Okay. Before any of that even really came into the scene. So, eh, I don't know. We'll we'll see where we'll see what happens to Chapman from here, but it, it raises the old eyebrow. The old eyebrow. We've got our eyes on you, our oldest Chapman. The home run he allowed to Josh Donaldson. Actually, I thought it was further than this, but 438 feet. Nelson Cruz, 457 feet. And ah, a very welcome see, Donaldson's kind of anointed himself the anti-sticky crusader, too. So yeah. I, I've got to tell you, Scott, as as a Yankee fan watching the game. It sucked, man. I, Gosh, going for the sweep. You're in the ninth inning. Offense is coming around. John Carlos Stanton's hot. Just get crushed in the ninth. It was, it sucked. I've, <laughs> I've got to say. Uh, before we hit the news and notes, you can follow and stream both Fantasy Baseball Today and FBT and 5 on Spotify. If you're listening on Spotify right now, go to the show page and hit that rectangle follow button so that when new episodes are dropped, they'll be at the top of your feed. And if you're listening elsewhere or watching on YouTube, give Spotify a try and drop us a follow. Some news and notes from Thursday. Nick Madrigal was placed on the 60-day IL with a right hamstring tear. Some potential replacements if you are in a shallower league. Ty France, Jonathan Scope, and Josh Rojas, they're all rostered in less than 70% of CBS League. Scott, who do you prefer from France, Scope, Rojas? I think actually Rojas, he's been kind of cold lately, but I still prefer him. And in deeper leagues, I will just throw the name out there, Brendan Rodgers. He's only 30% rostered. He went two for two on Thursday with his second home run of the season. I think he's coming around. I think it's happening. It's happening for Brendan Rodgers. I hope so. It's just, is the playing time going to be there? Which we always have to worry about with the Rockies. Now that Trevor Story's back, it yeah, yeah. I mean, the Rockies have their history, but yeah. If 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 it's happening for Brendan Rodgers, if he is breaking through and living up to the prospect pedigree, and and the Rockies do play a full week at home (laughs) next week, this upcoming week, so um, that that'll only help his cause. Uh, You know, obviously they're going to get him in the lineup. Josh Fuentes could easily, you know, hit the get get kicked to the curb there if they needed to. I, I they've been a little more committed to him than either Rogers or Hampson, uh, but that doesn't have to continue. Hit the road, Josh. Trevor Rosenthal is progressing quote rapidly through his strength program, according to A's manager Bob Melvin. Scott, if Rosenthal returned this season for the A's, do you think he would be the closer? I don't. Okay. I don't. I, I mean, we'll see what their bullpen looks like at the time because we're talking two months from now, right? <laughs> but no, the way the way Trevino's pitched and and Jake Diekman too, I I think that I don't think there would be much reason for them to switch to Rosenthal at that point as things currently stand. Byron Buxton had a double dong, not in the majors, but in the minors. He is currently on a rehab assignment at AAA. And uh, it's kind of wondering if even once Buxton returns, is Trevor Larnick going to stick around? I think he's been pretty good. I think he's earned the right to continue to stay with the team. He's batting 265 with an 830 OPS. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. 
uh, how exactly how the playing time would shake out there. Well, Kirilov leaving today with an injury. Uh, what did he injure? Ankle sprain? Yes. Not That doesn't sound like a major thing, though. So maybe maybe it won't put him on the IL. If it does, probably not for long. But that might buy them some time to delay that decision. But, you know, Rob Refsnyder, when he was looking indispensable, he he landed on the IL. Now he's back. He didn't miss that much time. But kind of feel like uh, it took the wind out of his sails in terms of, oh, we got to find a way to get Rob, Rob Refsnyder in the lineup. So um, you could definitely envision a scenario where Buxton is flanked by Larnack and Kirilov, at least until Max Kepler returns from injury. Right. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I mean, who knows Who knows what Miguel Sano's numbers are going to look like at that point. Obviously, Kirilov can play first base. It's possible to keep them all around and just rotate them. But yeah, I mean, Larnack is reach, reaching base at like a 390 clip. So it would, it would be genuinely surprising to me if he got option to the minors. The Twins, you know, we've talked about this before, Scott, how we are so player individually focused on this show that half the time I don't even know what the records are in baseball just from like a macro perspective but the twins are very bad this year they're 25 Mm -hmm. and 37 and if they start to sell off some of their older players and Nelson Cruz a Josh Donaldson that's going to open up more playing time for their youngsters Nick Gordon is another one who he's a former first round pick he was very bad in the minors he lost a lot of his prospect luster, but he's been really good since he's rejoined the team. So another name to pay attention there. I don't think you need to go out and add him, but if they start trading players away, I think, uh, I think Nick Gordon is a name to remember. John Carlos Stanton is likely to be benched for the Yankees this weekend as they have a two game set in a national league park against the Phillies. And they do not want him playing the outfield, at least not yet. Trevor story returned on Thursday. He finished one for three with a walk and a run scored. Alex Kirilov, which we mentioned, left with a low-grade ankle sprain. Kenta Maeda worked four innings of one-run ball in his rehab start Wednesday at AAA. He added five strikeouts. TJ Antone was not an option out of the Reds' bullpen on Thursday. Manager David Bell did not provide a reason. More on the fun Cincinnati Reds' bullpen a little bit later on. The Cardinals have activated Paul DeYoung. Luke Voigt could begin a rehab assignment on Sunday. Kevin Biggio could be reinstated this weekend. Travis Shaw landed on the IL with a dislocated left shoulder. And Jake Bowers was traded to the Mariners in exchange for cash considerations. I should have mentioned this at the top, but we are going to talk about prospects a little bit here because Scott released his prospect report on Thursday, and I think it's worth talking about. Before we get into those specific players that you wrote about, Scott, uh, I do want to mention Brewers pitching prospect Aaron Ashby was moved to the bullpen at AAA to work as a multi-inning reliever in preparation for an eventual call-up this season. I wonder if he their plan is, long-term for this season, to piggyback Freddie Peralta to limit his innings. So just something that came to mind there if you have Aaron Ashby in a dynasty league. Tigers outfield prospect Daz Cameron was recalled and was batting sixth on Thursday for the Tigers. He was batting 299 with two homers and four steals at AAA with a career best 17% strikeout rate. So I don't want to put too much stock into that. It's a small sample size this season so far, but uh, strikeouts have always been a huge is- issue for Daz Cameron, and he was making a lot more contact this year. According to Scott's prospect update article, which you can find on the site, I'll actually throw it in the podcast description so you can follow along. Five on the verge of being called up. Wander Franco, Vidal Brujan, Joe Adele, Jesus Sanchez, and Jaron Duran. That list hasn't really changed. We're, those are a few of the top prospects in the league that we're currently waiting on. And Scott, there, you actually- there, have, been, there have been some changes. Jackson Kawar was in there the yep. last couple weeks. Um. And and to clarify, these are the five that I think are most worth stashing in redraft leagues, not necessarily the five that I think will be up the soonest. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I would say Franco, Brujan, Adele, Sanchez. They're they're pretty much fixed there. Jaron Duran. I don't know. I don't know. He he just got back from Team USA, uh, qual- helping them qualify for the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And had a good performance there. Uh, and it just seems like, I mean, obviously the Red Sox are contenders this year. They have a center field problem. 
Duran is 24 years old and <laughs> playing well at AAA. Like it just seems too easy, right? That he'll be up at some point. But uh, but yeah, you haven't. I, I don't know. The Red Sox seem to be downplaying that idea. So could just be talk, but I don't know. I don't know. What did you, what did you want to ask me about though? I did want to ask you about uh, Jared Kelnick, who you led the article with, and obviously he was demoted earlier in the week. We didn't have you on the pros- uh, on the podcast that day, so I wanted uh-huh. to ask you if if you have Kelnick, would you keep holding on to him while he's demoted? I think in anything twelve teams or deeper, that's probably a good idea. If I intentionally left him out of the five on the verge for this week because I just I wrote a lot about him in the lead of the article and you know mm-hmm. I wanted to write about different players further down there. But you know, probably from next week forward he'll be in my five on the verge. And I would put him probably first. Uh, I, I I think I would continue to stash him over Wander Franco and Vidal Bruhan. Um and really those three are the only ones I'm genuinely excited to stash in redraft leagues, just based on the way prospect call ups have performed. Uh, going back to last year, which is something we've talked about. And really, I wrote a lot about it in the article. Um, Just the way they haven't really been paying off like we're used to, like we've grown accustomed to in recent history. So, um, yeah, the interesting thing about Kelnick, and maybe you guys talked about this when I wasn't on, is that like he, he seemed fine for... The, at the start, um, I, I'm specifically referring to strikeout rate. His first, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, his first 13 games, he struck out 16.4% of the time. Very good, right? Yeah. His final 10 games, he struck out 45.9% of the time. So Yikes. Uh, the way he characterized it is he was swinging well first, was getting unlucky, and then started to press. And I, I would say the strikeout rate itself seems to tell that same story. So I don't know. I don't know that Kelnick, uh, whatever's going on with prospects when they first get called up and struggling so badly, I don't know that Kelnick necessarily fits into that category because I, I think it's probably true. He was just having bad luck at first, um, but, you know, clearly needed a reset down in the minor leagues because he was spiraling after, uh, after having after running into that bad luck and trying to force the issue. So I think he'll be up soon and I think there's a good chance he'll be he'll be great from that point forward. But it is awfully frustrating to think you had this ace in the hole and then it turns out he hits 096 and gets sent to the minors again. Yep. It's definitely disappointing, but as we've seen with a lot of prospects, not all prospects. But a lot of them the past two years, it's it's been a pretty rough go here. Scott's five prospects that are on the periphery. Bryson Stott, a shortstop for the Phillies. Brett Beatty, a third baseman for the Mets. Miguel Vargas, a third baseman for the Dodgers. Jake Adair, a starting pitcher for the Marlins. And Ken Waldachuk, a starting pitcher from the Bronx Bombers, the New York Yankees. Let's jump into the Week 12 Pitcher and Hitter Planners presented by Line and Kugels. And as always, Scott, we will start with your favorite two start pitchers heading into next week. Okay, yeah, my favorite two start pitchers. Uh, not a great week for two start sleepers. Put that out there right away. But if you must have them, Jordan Montgomery... Um, He's getting close to 80% roster ship, but he is making two starts and he's been he's been pretty good lately. His matchups are nothing special at Toronto versus Oakland. And uh, I wouldn't call him must start necessarily, but he's probably the most attractive two star pitcher who might be available. Austin Gomber would be more attractive if his two starts weren't at home. That makes it very scary uh, rolling the dice on him. But uh, one of his two matchups is against the Brewers, who are a bottom five offense, and he's he's been great lately. He's been pretty much since the start of May. Gomper's been good, and including at home. Most of his starts have been on the road, but including at home. So it might work out. It's, it's just a, a roll of the dice for sure. Uh, Marco Gonzalez, 63% rostered, and a second start from the IL didn't go as well as the first. But, you know, obviously there's a pretty good track record there. One of his matchups is against the Rays, who have struggled against left-handed pitchers. 
Shane McClanahan, his last two starts have been pretty rough, but at the White Sox, at Seattle, those are pretty good matchups for McClanahan. Tucker Davidson, we just talked about earlier, he's the most available of the ones I've mentioned so far, 35% rostered on CBS. Problem there is one of his matchups is against the Red Sox, others against the Cardinals, which is not a great matchup, but it's, it's not so bad either. Uh, and then if you want me to keep going, one last one. I I really don't feel great about this one. I don't feel great about any of them, but especially not this one. But Vladimir Gutierrez, highly available, 18% rostered. One of his two matchups is at Milwaukee. You know, Obviously, he's pitched well so far, but I'm skeptical because of the high fly ball rate. The, the second matchup is at San Diego, which San Diego does not rate as high as you think they do in terms of team OPS. So that's actually not such a bad matchup. Uh, but yeah, the, we're, we're kind of reaching to the point where we're looking at Vladimir Gutierrez. I wanted to ask you about Bruce Zimmerman, Scott, who looks like he's on par for on par on pace for two starts next week. He's 7%. Yeah. Awesome. He, I, I don't think he is. That was one I had to uh, yeah. remove when I, when I looked at rotation alignments and, and, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I'm wrong sometimes, but it looks like Zimmerman is starting this weekend and Matt Harvey's actually the Orioles pitcher lined up for two starts. Zimmerman would be pretty interesting if he was lined up for two starts, but I don't think he is. All right, Scott. So let's take a look at some of those uh, single start sleepers that you like for next week. I think I heard you mention Mike Miner is one of them for next week. Yes, yes. Tarek Skubal at Kansas City. That's probably my favorite sleeper pitcher overall. Kind of run he's been on. Strikeouts jumping up over his past few starts. Yusei Kikuchi against the Rays. He's been pitching well of late, and I mentioned earlier the Rays struggle against left-handed pitchers. Mike Miner has the Tigers. It's pretty good. Uh-huh. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll try tapping into JT Brubaker again because he has he's facing Cleveland. So that's... That's been a dicey one. Brew Baker appears on this list a lot, and I don't know how often it's it's worked out for you, but yeah, I'll, I'll go to him one more time here. JT Brew Baker is your sleeper pitcher to your CJ Crone as your sleeper hitter, Scott. Yep, CJ Crone's is on the sleeper hitter list for this week with the Rockies at home for full seven games. Now they're they're probably tenth respectively on the pitcher and hitter sleeper list. They do a top 10 every week They're, Each of those guys is 10th. So I'm just tacking them on there almost for old time's sake, Frank. Cause you know, if, if I leave them off and the one week it actually pays off, then I'll feel pretty dumb. What other hitters are you looking at Scott outside of CJ Crone? So, uh, I mentioned the Rockies have a full week at home. Home, one of the two teams visiting is the Brewers, which is good news for Avisal Garcia. It's also good news for Willie Adamez, who has had back-to-back multi-hit games here. And uh, you look at his career splits, you, you realized how much Tropicana Field was holding him back. Uh, so Coors Field, other end of the spectrum. His other series this week is at Miller Park, so also opposite end of the spectrum. I don't think it's called Miller Park anymore, right? They recently changed their name. Did they? I think so. I think I heard that. I'll look it up. It's a shame. Miller Park, Coors Field, Battle of the Brands. It is. Will, Willie Adamas was taking the beer tour. American Family Field is what Google is telling. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, um, Justin Upton. He's got a hit, hitting streak going. Been really productive since moving to the leadoff spot for the Angels. I think he's still batting there. And... Uh, Four left-handers on the schedule. He has a near 1,000 OPS against left-handers so far this season, Justin Upton does. Tigers have pretty good matchups this week. Robbie Grossman is now homered in back-to-back games, so he's picking it up again. Of course, we know Jonathan Scope is hot. I like both of them. I mentioned Crone. I mentioned Rogers earlier. Brendan Rogers, with all those home games, is on this list. And uh, I'm going to leave it there. There's a couple other names I could mention, but then you wouldn't have to go read the article. So can't give the whole thing away here on the podcast. Professional broadcaster. It. Professional That's broadcaster right. Scott That's White right. with the old T's. Go read the article, of course, cbssports.com slash fantasy slash baseball. And just to recap, the five teams with the best hitter matchups, Cleveland, the Mets, 
the Brewers, the Padres, and the Nationals, the five teams with the worst hitter matchups for next week, the Astros, the Rangers, the Phillies, the Reds, and the D-backs. So there you have it, the Week 12 Pitcher and Hitter Planners presented by Line and Kugels. And I'll actually be at City Field on Friday enjoy, enjoying Jacob deGrom versus Fernando Tatis. I am super excited about this matchup. If anyone else watching or listening to this is going to be at City Field, hit me up. We'll meet up. We'll... We'll grab a beer or something. And speaking of beers, I'll have one or two before I leave for the stadium. Little pregame action. There's nothing better to do that with than a Lining Kugels Summer Shandy to get you ready for that baseball game. It's an awesome blend of crisp beer with refreshing lemonade that honestly just hits different. And the Summer Shandy isn't all they offer. They also have a Session Hellas, which has all the flavor of a crisp German style beer, but it's only 99 calories. And if you're into IPAs, Line and Kugels offers their Lemon Haze IPA, which is a well balanced hazy IPA that blends hops with delicious lemonade. So no matter what type of beverage you are craving, Line and Kugels has you covered. Just head on over to Liney.com. That's L E I N I E.com. Or follow Line and Kugels on Instagram or Facebook for more information about all of the delicious beers that they brew. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we've got to talk about Dallas Keuchel. Dallas Keuchel? Really? Do it next here on Fantasy Baseball Today. So Dallas Keuchel was that other pitcher, random pitcher, with all these whiffs on Thursday. He was going up <laughs> against the Toronto Blue Jays. Six innings, six hits, two runs, two walks, eight strikeouts, and a season high 21. That's right. 21 swinging strikes. On 104 pitches, his previous season high in swinging strikes was actually 13. He threw a season high 35 cutters, and I love it. I don't know why he didn't do it sooner. It was far and away his best pitch last season, and he threw it 31% of the time last year when he had a great, whatever it was, 10, 12 starts. Uh, But entering Thursday, he was only using the cutter 21% of the time this season. Again, that is Dallas Keuchel. And I know he's fringy, Scott, but I I thought this was very encouraging. I agree. It was encouraging. Uh, I want to see more of it. I don't think he's going to have another 21 swinging strikes. I think that was just a total anomaly. But yeah, emphasizing the cutter may be the path forward for him. And uh, we'll see where it goes from here. I'm actually looking to see if 21 swinging strikes was his career high. Okay, I got back as far back as 2016. He had a 23 swinging strike game. So not. It, it was not a career high for Dallas Keuchel, but it was one of his best. Clearly. I, should probably, I should probably ask you this after the podcast, Scott, but maybe other people are wondering as well, and, and this can help them do some of their own research, but where do you go to find game log swinging strikes? Because I go to baseball, I go to Brooks baseball, but I have to like calculate all of them together. And it baseball takes reference. If you look at the player's game log, it has a, a swinging strikes column. So that's what I, that's where I'm looking. Uh, I don't know if the count ends up being the same as, as, uh, as baseball savants. I don't know. Sometimes there seems to be a discrepancy there. I don't know why there would be, because that seems like something you should be able to count pretty easily if you're watching. Yeah. But I don't know for whatever reason, they don't often line up exactly. That is probably the biggest flaw in my analysis is I don't know how to use baseball reference. So <laughs> I think I need you to teach me, Scott. We've got to we've got to do a baseball reference tutorial because uh, I feel like there's a lot on there that I am not taking advantage of. So I think it's still yeah. the most powerful. It, 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 it offers the most bang for the buck of any of the sites. Uh, uh, it doesn't have quite the same level of sophistication as baseball savant or fan graphs, but it just has it 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 has the the highest concentration of useful and usable the the best combination of that all right so well uh that's, that's my that's my promotion for baseball reference free promotion there uh we'll hook up at some point and, and you'll teach me we had a pitching masterpiece in philly on thursday ian anderson against zach wheeler and ian anderson seven shutout four hits one walk four strikeouts this comes after two clunkers so a welcome sight there from ian anderson and then zach wheeler i mean even in my best possible projection 
I don't think I could have seen this coming from Zach Wheeler against the Braves. Yeah. Eight shutout, four hits, zero walks, 12 strikeouts for Wheeler over his last five starts, a 1.49 ERA, 56 strikeouts to just five walks, 56 to five, over 36 and two thirds innings pitch for Wheeler. He lowers the ERA to 2.29. The whip is now down at 0.90. And Scott, my question to you is, should we rank Wheeler ahead of his teammate, Aaron Nola, rest of season? I'm starting to wonder. Yeah, we might be there. We might be to that point. Uh, I was a little skeptical of Wheeler's jump and strikeouts when it first started, but now this is four out of five starts, double digit strikeouts, and the whiff rate is way up. And the pitch selection has changed. I mean, he's it's he's kind of gone to the old trick of ditching the sinker for more four seamers and and sliders. It's it's more of a a maximize the missing of bats approach. And uh, not only that, but he's getting in ahead of the count better. He's throwing more strikes. So that combination has really allowed him to have this, this kind of second breakthrough where he goes from good to great. And uh, obviously with each passing start, I buy into it more and more. I don't know that anything's wrong with Aaron Nola lately, but he's, it's been kind of frustrating. He's he's definitely underachieved so far. Can I drop Mac Chapman? This is a question that I received on Twitter, and I was going to pair him up with Eduardo Rodriguez, who we've already sp- spoken about. So Matt Chapman, he's he went over two. Uh, well, at least over two last time that I checked. Probably update that. Uh, but last time I saw, he was batting two oh two with a six thirty three. OPS is Matt Chapman, and he's still 89% rostered. What did he finish? No, he went 0 for 3, so that's now 201 with a 630 OPS for Matt Chapman. He's still 89% rostered. Uh, The the problem is, and we've talked about this before, who are you dropping Matt Chapman for? Because I'll read off a bunch of third basemen right now that are rostered in less than 70% of CBS leagues. None of them really excite me. So, Scott, would you drop Matt Chapman for Miguel Sano? Um, yeah, I, I don't look, I'd, I'd rather start Sano next week. So I, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to say that, but like, I, the only reason you'd be holding on to Chapman right now is because of track record, right? There's, there is nothing redeeming in actual numbers. The rate of heart contact is terrible. The amount of contact has been terrible. You expected stats. I'll look awful, and of course the actual stats do too. And this is after an off season where he had surgery to repair a torn labrum in his hip, which, I mean, part of the reason we thought Buster Posey was done as a fantasy asset is because his first year back from that same surgery, he didn't look so good at the plate either. So it that it may be affecting Chapman a lot, and it may not be this year where we see him make a full recovery from it. So Sano is not somebody I have a lot of confidence in, but twins have pretty good matchups next week. He's been hitting the ball well for the past week. I I don't, I just don't really see you regretting that move. I, I not so much because Sano will be good, but just because I, I don't, I, I'd be surprised if you end up missing Chapman. Just give me a yes or no on these, Scott. Okay. Would you drop Matt Chapman for Alec Bohm? I guess. How about guess. for Patrick Wisdom? Uh, yeah, I mean, right. You're not getting me excited about these names, but yeah. I might, I might, oh, man, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I imagine the guy who's asking already has somebody else he can plug in at third base, but maybe, maybe not. Yeah. That might be maybe. the case. Uh, a few other names. Hunter Dozier? No. Jonathan India? Ooh. No, I, know, I don't think I could do it. And the last one is Luis Arias for the Brewers. No. All right. Luis- I know that was painful. That was like extracting <laughs> teeth. 
<laughs> no, it was, it was fine. Uh, Luis Castillo made a start on Thursday, which means we have to talk about it. He went five and two thirds, one hit, three earned runs, three walks, seven strikeouts, 14 swinging strikes on 96 pitches. Pretty good ratio there for him. Uh, he only allowed four hearted balls. I thought that was a step in the right direction. He actually left the game with runners on first and second. He was only allowing one run at the time. Lucas Sims. That's right. Lucas Sims, the closer, the one that we have dubbed the closer of the Cincinnati Reds, came in in the sixth inning of the game, and he went on to allow three runs to score. So obviously, two of those were charged to Luis Castillo. The final line doesn't look very good, but I actually thought that Luis Castillo pitched much better in this one. So that's two solid starts in a row now. Uh, anything that you would like to add, Scott, on Luis Castillo? Yeah, it is two solid starts in a row. Obviously, you shouldn't be flirting with the idea of dropping him right now. I think more likely starting him because he is in line for two starts next week at Milwaukee at San Diego. Uh, so I think in points leagues, I, I would say yes to that for sure. And even in categories leagues, I might consider it. Uh, as for Sims, you know, clearly it was a high leverage situation he was brought into. So... I don't know that that negates the idea that he's their most trusted reliever right now, at least, you know, other than Anton, who they're probably not going to use in safe situations. Uh, five of his previous appearances had been four saves. You know, since he struggled so much, I wonder if David Bell loses confidence in him, but I, I would still say Sims is the guy to have in that bullpen for saves. All right, let's hit a few waiver wire options here, Scott. I'll... Read off what they've done recently. You tell me your excitement level. Or let's just do, are they a must-add? That's probably a better way to do it. Jonathan Scope went three for four with his 10th home run on Thursday. His last 24 games, 24. Pretty big sample-ish, kind of. 358 batting average with eight home runs. He is 63% roster. Scott, must-add, Jonathan Scope. I wouldn't say must add. No, no. I, I think I think there's a limited ceiling here. I think we know exactly who he is, and he's hot right now. And I like him as a sleeper hitter for this upcoming week, but I don't think he's going to be a fixture for uh, for standard size leagues moving forward. Willie Adamas went two for five with two doubles and two runs scored. He is 39% rostered. And shout out to Tom Brubeck, who tweeted me this earlier, and he said... Brubaker? <laughs> not brew baker brew he uh he said adamas continues to have an 865 ops away from tropicana field in over 700 plate appearances at this point must add willie adamas yay or nay well n no I, the must add threshold i think is pretty high like i'm just i'm afraid i'm gonna end up saying no to all these guys all right but so what I like Adamus for next week. If you need a shortstop, he's probably one of the more attractive ones out there, but um, I'm sure he's available in some of my leagues and I'm not rushing out to add him in all of them. So that, that by definition makes him not must add, right? I think so. And the last one I'll mention, Joey Votto went one for four with his sixth home run. He did add two strikeouts. He's only batting 217, just returned from injury, but he is hitting the ball the hardest he ever has in the StatCast era this year at... I don't have his age in front of me, but I'm sure he's approaching 40 years old. Uh, at 262 XBA, 518 X slug. Those are very good numbers for Joey Votto. It's just, it uh -huh. hasn't translated yet. He's 44% rostered, Scott. Your excitement level for Joey Votto. Yeah, and maybe we should have stuck to that, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that standard. Um, yeah, it's, it's, let's put it on a one to 10 scale. All right. We're, we're, we're figuring out this segment as we go. And I would say my excitement level for Joey Votto is about a six. I think that's, uh, yeah, I was kind of excited for him before he broke his thumb. Now that he's back, I think he could end up being use usable at a position where I know I have a need in several leagues. I would probably rather invest in Votto than like Josh Bell at this point. They said Josh kind of weird. Josh Bell. Let's try that again with a little more confidence. Josh Bell. It's not my kind of guy. Joey Votto is. There you go. Did we just create a new meter? Is that the excite o meter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or I guess we could go with like waverometer, but eh, that's kind of boring. I, I like excite o meter more. So yeah. It's more exciting. <laughs> For sure. Joey Votto is six on the excite o meter in deeper leagues. Mentioned the name a few times now. Jake Fraley 
He stole another base on Thursday. He now has three steals over his last seven games. So in deeper five outfielder leagues, he's only 5% rostered. And Christian Arroyo for the Red Sox, he went one for three with his second home run of the season. He added four RBI, so not overly exciting, obviously. But he is batting 284 on the season and has started seven of the last nine games for the Boston Red Sox. I was going to go into a deeper look on what's going on with Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman this season, and even Cody Bellinger, the three early round picks that are not performing to the level we expected them to this season. Um, but we have other things that I would like to get to. So uh, is there anything in particular that you would like to hit quickly on Betts, Freeman, or Bellinger? No, not specifically. Yeah. I'm scared. I'm curious about what's going on with Mookie Betts and how much it has to do with all the environment changes we've seen this year, but I don't have any real conclusions yet. I suspect he's still going to be a top five outfielder, but it's it's a situation I don't feel like I I have a great handle on yet. For Mookie Betts, you mentioned the environment, Scott. I think that's a good place to start with him. 7.6% home run to, to fly ball ratio. Entering Thursday last year, that was 19%. And the uh, in each of the previous three years, 2018 through 2020, it was at least 13%. So way down for Mookie Betts. Some of the, you know, some of his hard hit numbers are down as well. So that will factor into that. But but it would appear the environment's about to change again. So yeah, that, that's that's like I. It's hard to say anything environment related with a great deal of confidence right now because in addition to the deadened baseball we now have um a spin change happening so who knows who knows where we go from here Freddie, certainly not me freddie freeman of this group has the best underlying numbers so i, I think he's just been really unlucky he's got a 220 yeah. bad up on the season that's three yeah, I, I, for his career so yeah i i have zero concerns about freddie freeman I've I've long had concerns about Cody Bellinger. Yep. I am developing mild concerns for Mookie Betts, but ultimately I'd I'd be more likely to buy him than sell him right now. Cody Bellinger, I'm not so sure that I would be looking to buy. He's betting 200 in 11 games since returning from the IL. Hard contact is way down. Strikeouts are way up. Remember, coming back from off-season shoulder surgery, so I think this is Kind of expected a, a slowish start for him. Uh, some Thursday leftovers, Gene Segura, three for five with three RBI. He's now batting 323 on the season. He's been great. Odubel Herrera went two for four with his fourth steal of the season. He has let off eight straight games for the Phillies, only 30% rostered if you are desperate for an outfielder. Mitch Hanniger had a double dong and now has 16 home runs in the season. He's slowed down quite a bit. Uh, he's got a 238 batting average over his last 21 games. But the expected numbers are still very good for Mitch Hanniger. Uh Glaber Torres went three for four on Thursday, albeit only three singles. Uh, he is now batting 338 in 23 games since hitting his first home run back on May 9th. So I think he was pressing for that first homer, and now things are starting to fall into place. Still hasn't been a lot of power, but the batting average, very good for Glaber Torres recently. Uh, Christian Vasquez had a big game, and he, and he needed it. He went three for four with three runs scored and three RBI. Not a lot of bullpen updates, but that's fine. I'm actually okay with that. Uh, for the <laughs> Phillies, Hector Neris uh, had his third blown save of the season. He allowed a solo home run to Freddie Freeman in the ninth. I kind of give him a pass for that, obviously. And Liam Hendricks got his 16th save of the season. To stream or not to stream, Scott, for the weekend. And we will start with Friday. Keegan Aiken at the Rays. Garrett Richards versus the Blue Jays. Tarek Skubal versus the White Sox. Justin Dunn at Cleveland. Brady Singer at the A's and Cole Irvin versus the Royals. This list was much worse yesterday, so it got better. It got better. How did it get better? I, I was Scoobal here yesterday because no, he wasn't. I like Scoobal in all circumstances. Yes. Uh, yesterday I picked Irvin versus KC. I'm going to stick with that, and I think I picked Garrett Richards versus Toronto. Going to stick with that for Saturday. Alex Cobb at the Diamondbacks. James Caprillion versus the Royals. Jackson Kawar at the A's, Vince Velasquez versus the Yankees, Joe Ross versus the Giants, and Cy Young contender John Gant at the Cubs. Come on. Did you see his last start? Come yeah. on. He turned back into John Gant. Yeah, he, the, yeah, the magic wore off. James Caprillion versus KC. 
it's pretty good. No, none of the others are very good. <laughs> Cobb has been okay recently, and the Diamondbacks are bad. Yeah. I I guess I'm not wild. I, John Gant might actually be my second choice here. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Saturday is rough. We'll just leave it at that. Sunday. I actually think Sunday is okay here, Scott. Patrick Sandoval versus the Diamondbacks. Chris Bubich at the A's. Adrian Hauser versus the Pirates. Drew Smiley at the Marlins. Logan Gilbert at Cleveland. And Martin Perez versus the Blue Jays. How many swinging strikes did Sandoval have in his last start? 32? I think so. It's good to see him getting another start after that. I think I would prefer Adrian Hauser versus Pittsburgh to him, to to, to Sandoval. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh has officially become the worst offense in terms of OPS. Uh, but Sandoval would probably be my second choice. And my third choice... Gilberg. Gilberg. Logan Gilbert? All right, fine. Logan Gilbert. <laughs> I was actually saying Gilberg. It was, it's a wrestling thing, Scott. So we, we oh. don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But, but yeah. you wanted you wanted me to pick Logan Gilbert, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I I don't mind Logan Gilbert against Cleveland. It's actually Logan Gilbert versus Shane Bieber. So I have I have no frame of reference for wrestling. That that whole phenomenon just passed me by. Oh, man, I could go down a rabbit hole. All right, I'll just tell you very quickly. Gilberg was a parody of Goldberg, who actually played college football at the University of Georgia. I did football. know that, yeah. I so did know that. Very popular in the state of Atlanta. State of Atlanta. Oh, gosh. It's been a long week, Scott. <laughs> in the state of Georgia. So I thought I would just marry those two things together because obviously you are from there. Let's wrap this whole thing up with some Apple podcast review questions. Leave a five-star review with a question if you enjoy the podcast and we will answer it in the future. This one's from the ginger King 1031 grade, the trade 12 team Roto keeper league. I give Charlie Blackman for Tim Anderson and the Yerminator. Your mean Mercedes. A yes. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the other person is thinking. You love to hear that yeah. from Austin Frankie. Hey, that's me. Not really. Grade the trade. 10 team, 5x5 five five Roto with seven keepers. I give Anthony Rendon and Lucas Giolito for Nick Castellanos and Craig Kimbrell. We, uh, currently in ninth place, really needed saves, ERA, runs, home run, RBI. Oh. It's a no for me. It's a no for me, dog. It's a no for me. Uh, it's a I deep don't, plus. I don't think it's. I don't think it's egregious, actually, Scott. I, I think it's a C minus. I wouldn't have done the trade. I think Giolito for Castellanos at this point is a fair trade. Rendon for Kimbrel. I think in a vacuum, you probably still want Rendon, but Kimbrel has been one of the three best closers in fantasy this year. He's been really good. Yeah. Uh, part of it for me is the keeper aspect. Yeah. If, sure. it, if, if it was just a, I, I could maybe give it a C minus if it was just a, a redraft league, but with the keeper consideration there, I'll go D plus. That, that is fair. 12 team head to head points. Oh, this one's from Jerry in New Jersey. 12 team head to head points start four outfielders, two utility and six starting pitchers. I have a beefy pitching staff. Thanks to you guys. Who should I trade to receive a high profile hitter? Mostly need outfield, but can upgrade anywhere. What would it take to get a Rafael Devers or J.D. Martinez type? I have Jacob DeGrom, Max Scherzer, Corbin Burns, Lance Lynn, Ian Anderson, Sandy Alcantara, Framber Valdez, and Luis Castillo. It is a keeper league, so Burns is kind of untouchable. Yeah, he should be. I'd be most likely to shop Lynn, I think. Yes, that is the I think, answer. I, I think that's the best combination of uh, you, you'll you actually get something high quality for him, but particularly con considering it's a keeper league, you can you, you won't mind giving him up as much as, as some of the others. So, yeah, shop Len. He might be able to get you a Devers or a J.D. Martinez type. I, I would look more, I, I would look first to who needs the pitcher versus what's what precise hitter do you want and then see you know what kind of hitters they might have available for trade 
But yeah, you, you should aim very high with Lance Lynn. And that is so important, Scott, that you bring up, and you brought it up before, but when making trades, it's not about what players you want. It could be what categories do I need, but you have to look at what is your position of strength for this gentleman it is pitching, and you have to find someone who is compatible, a trade companion who is in need of pitching. So don't just lock on to certain players, although you might want them. You got to find someone who needs pitching, ultimately. So uh, it's a good point that you bring up there. From Spike Vermont, grade the trade. 12 team head-to-head -head points with five outfielders. Send a Eugenio Suarez for... Jock Peterson. Peterson. Why did I say that? <laughs> Peterson. We've both been saying words and names strangely it's, today. Whenever we get to Friday's podcast, Scott, it's just, it's wacky, man. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't think Jock Peterson has much value in a 12 team league, even a five outfielder format. I know Suarez has been terrible, but. I, I still retain some hope for him bouncing back. So I I it this trade's a no for me. I think it's a D. Ooh. Eugenio Suarez in points leagues this season is averaging 2.2 fantasy points per game. Scott, would you like to guess what Jock Peterson is averaging this season? In a standard points league, uh two four. 2.2, the same exact amount ah, as A. Eugenio Suarez. Yeah. And as bad as Suarez has been, I would still bet on him being better than Jock Peterson rest of season. The last one of the week. We're here. We did it. From Kevy Two Time. Great the trade. 12 team headset categories. Send Mar Marcus Semyon for Trevor Story. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to do it. Yep. And I would give it a B. Plus. All right. And you know what? I just realized as I was saying that, it kind of sounded like I didn't appreciate what we do, Scott. Like, we're here. We did it. It's the end of the week. It's it's not like that. So I, would... I, I think you should celebrate that we made it to the end of your notes. When's the last time that happened? <laughs> <laughs> now, that is something worth celebrating. So I rescind my statement about being excited that the week is over. I'm actually sad. I wish we could podcast every day of the week. No, I don't actually wish that. <laughs> <laughs> we need off. Be careful what you wish it. for, sir. I need to wrap this thing up. For Scott, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again on Monday. Bye-bye.